Good evening once again, everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar on highly pathogenic avian influenza for small flocks. And uh, my name is Abby Schuft. I am an extension educator at the University of Minnesota specializing in poultry. And I'll be your host this evening. If you are just joining us, or if you've been on a webinar with us before, how you can interact with us this evening is to use the Q&A box. And that will be an icon that shows up on the bottom of your screen. If you are using a mobile device, I'm not sure where it will be exactly. I know it differs between some Android devices and the Apple products, um, but whatever you're doing, look for that Q&A box and you can enter your question at any time and we will get to it at the end of the evening. We have a full um, hour of presentations ready for you this evening. Um, and if you joined us last year during any of our High Path webinars, I will be right up front that this will be a review for you um, with the exception of a status update and like a situation update of what is happening with highly pathogenic avian influenza. But the review will be great for all of you to brush up on what's happening with human health aspects, where you can find information about highly pathogenic avian influenza in the state, as well as the human health impacts um, for all the people that we love in our families and our friends. So I am Abby Schaft, as I introduced earlier, um, I'm an extension educator for the University of Minnesota. I'm going to kick things off this evening. We also have with us Dr. Shauna Voss from the Minnesota Board of Animal Health, Michael Cruzan from the Minnesota Board of Animal Health as their communications director, and Dr. Joni Sheftel from the Minnesota Department of Health. And here's what we're going to do this evening. Um, I'm going to kick things off and get started with the basics of highly pathogenic avian influenza, give you some of the history and some of the science behind it so that you have a little better understanding of what we're talking with and what we're trying to prevent in our birds. Dr. Voss is then going to give an update of what is currently happening with HPAI in the state, um, how to recognize signs in your flocks, and the importance of reporting and testing any suspected cases. Michael is then going to share with us some tools that are at your disposal through the state um, to report your birds, um, to watch what's happening with your birds, um, or not watch what's happening, but watch what's happening in the state with highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, and then Dr. Sheftel is going to give us some insights about um, the human health aspects of avian influenza. And then I'm going to close it up with biosecurity and steps that you can take at home with your small flocks. And then after that, then that's when we will open up that question and answer uh, session. Um, I will also apologize at this point that um, our guests don't have camera capabilities. Um, there were some communication uh, misunderstandings when this meeting was set up and I do not have the capabilities to turn their cameras on. So I'm glad I showed you their photos earlier so you can have a visual context of the voice you're hearing, but unfortunately you won't be able to see them while they are presenting, but you will be able to see their slides and their information this evening. So starting off with the history of highly pathogenic avian influenza, this really is not a new disease. Um, it may be new for you because you're new to poultry um, or you um, just have had other things on your mind, um, but the virus is not new to the United States. And it was first discovered in the late 1800s. Um, and it was discovered because of high death rates that were, and, and they showed different signs than other diseases and afflictions that scientists and producers already knew about. And so it was considered a very low risk disease, meaning there wasn't very many cases of it up through the mid nineties. Um, so just more recently, when you're thinking about disease standards, 
And then in 2014, 2015, we had a very significant outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza. And it moved from the Western part of the United States um, and it moved eastward. And it hit Minnesota in March, early March of 2015. And in total, there were 211 commercial flocks affected in the country and 21 backyard flocks. And within those um, 220 cases, 230 cases, 50 million birds were affected with highly pathogenic avian influenza. At that point in time, it was the most impactful, the most notable and the most devastating animal disease outbreak that the United States had faced. We learned a lot of lessons from 2014 and 2015. Moving forward into 2022, in early February, the first case was detected in South Carolina in a wild bird, and it has continued to persist in the United States ever since. Um, Dr. Voss will shed some more light on it, but we, we have had a break, and we had a break last summer but it just seems to come in waves, but it's not a disease that we are in the United States are completely free of. Um, and so we still need to be watching for it and continuing to um, mitigate the risk. So avian influenza um, currently in the outbreak um, with our backyard flocks, sorry, this date I didn't change, but the, um, so uh, here we go on this slide. This date I didn't change, my apologies. This is as of this morning. There are 505 backyard flocks confirmed to have had highly pathogenic avian influenza since February of last year. These backyard flocks comprise 61% of the total cases in this outbreak in the United States. Um, and the flock size ranges from two birds to more than 600. So there's not a limitation to the flock size and it doesn't make you immune to the virus just because you have a small amount of birds. Um, as you can see, these populations vary from very, very small to larger um, scale backyard populations. Um, those 505 backyard flocks is a very different number and significantly more than the 21 flocks that we saw in the 2014-2015 outbreak. And um, it has affected 47 states, so with backyard flocks having HPAI. So there's only three states in the United States that haven't had a case of backyard um, flocks being infected, and those are Hawaii, Louisiana and West Virginia. So the cause of avian influenza is a virus and a virus needs a live host to live. So it's looking for those live animals in order to survive and thrive. And then that's how it can get passed along as well. Avian influenza is never a stable virus. It's constantly changing. And so it has to change so that it can survive and continue its ability to spread from bird to bird. And when that happens, the ability for it to cause disease changes and increases as well. So what happens when flu viruses change, they become more virulent. That means they become stronger, which then in turn reduces how much of that virus it needs to infect a bird. So it will take less virus to infect a bird as that virus becomes stronger. And as it's becoming stronger, it can also spread to new species. And I believe Dr. Voss is gonna talk maybe a little bit about this. And I know Dr. Joni Sheptel is talking about this a little bit too, how different species have been affected by this most recent outbreak compared to maybe 2015's outbreak. Influenza is going to be classified by two of the proteins that it's made up of. And these are gonna be some terms that maybe you're familiar with because you've heard them in the news for various reasons. And they're going to be identified by H's, 
which are hemagglutinin, and there are 16 different H's. So there's always a number associated with the H. So there's an H1, there's an H7, there's an H16. Um, and then the other protein is a neuraminidase, and that's also identified by a number, so a one through a nine. And with these combinations, and I realized that 16 times nine is not 264, but there's all sorts of different ways genetically that these proteins can shuffle together and they can create up to 264 subtypes of an influenza virus. So when we're talking about human influenza viruses or avian influenza or swine influenza or canine influenza that I'm hearing about in the news right now, they're all different combinations of H's and N's. Avian influenza is specific to the H5 and the H7 influenzas. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about avian influenza, our H5 and H7 viruses. Um, influenza can be classified as highly pathogenic or low pathogenic. And there might be some confusion if you're hearing some of these terms. So I just want to clarify quickly. And um, the, the, the subtype of that HN combination is what can determine if it's going to be highly pathogenic or low pathogenic. Low pathogenic means it's going to be very mild it's going to be non-fatal and the birds can recover from a low pathogenic avian influenza. They will be okay. Highly pathogenic means it's quickly spreading and the poultry will die from that virus because it just comes on so quick and it takes over and they have no opportunity to recover. Here's just a uh, a table that compares some of these things where low path is going to be mild symptoms. You might notice a drop in um, egg production. You might see signs that are going to be parallel to a respiratory illness where with a high path avian influenza, you're going to see severe signs like death that will be often unexplained, especially with your smaller flocks. Low path avian influenza is actually a common infection where highly pathogenic has been considered a rare infection. It's considered a foreign animal disease, meaning it's not commonly in the United States. It's a foreign disease. Low path is spread through networks, neighborhoods, communities. Um, the easiest way, the most simple ways to compare like a neighborhood and, and a cold, um, it's, it just spreads through those networks where highly pathogenic avian influenza can also spread through networks, but also by proximity. And the density of um, birds in communities in our commercial population, Minnesota is the number one producer of turkeys in the United States, we have a lot of turkeys here. And so that increases our population density, which also increases the opportunity for farms to be close to one another. Remember those H5 and H7 proteins I was talking about that identify a virus as avian influenza? Um, they are regulated by government officials. Birds can also become sick with influenza if they are not an H5 or an H7, so they could get an H3. Dr. Boss will have to clarify that, but they can get other H type virus, influenza viruses, and those are not gonna be regulated because those are not common to those birds and they're going to be considered low pathogenicity and that those birds will be able to recover. On the other hand, highly pathogenic avian influenza is very highly regulated because it has such an impact on um, our production, on our trade, on the way um, farmers can do business. And it's a disease that can take birds so, so, so quickly that we need to regulate it and stop it as quickly as possible. And we do that through regulation. And then finally, um, there is zoonotic potential with both of the versions of avian influenza. And Dr. Sheftel is going to talk about that if you don't know what zoonosis is already. It's coming up. 
And birds can stop shedding low path avian influenza after they seal, serial convert, meaning once they've acquired antibodies, they're gonna stop shedding that virus. With highly pathogenic avian influenza, they don't get the opportunity to serial convert because most often that animal is going to die before they even have a chance to recover. So how does influenza get to your farm or to your premises? And it's gonna come in many ways and we continue, we being scientists, researchers, veterinarians, regulators, we're continuing to learn how influenza is moving, specifically this strain of avian influenza. But primarily right now, it's going to begin with contact with ducks, geese, and other wild flying birds. Um, if you have wild birds that visit your farm or your home, um, make sure that you can control any feed spills. Make sure you can control if those wild birds have access to your birds' feeders. Any pools of water. I understand right now it's a challenge. We've just had very quick snow melt and it's been raining or snowing for multiple days at a time. I have standing water in my yard right now, which I don't have normally have standing water. So I do realize that's a challenge. But if it's there for a prolonged period of time, consider doing something so that you're not attracting other wild birds to your farm premises where your birds are, are living um, and, and um, just chilling out, I guess, where, where they are, where they're making their space. Um, hunting can be a risk if you have hunters in your family or if you are a hunter. Waterfowl hunting can be a risk. Um, bringing some of that gear back and forth Fishing can be a risk. Trapping any animals could potentially be a risk. And um, when we looked at the first 37 backyard farms that had avian influenza in earlier 2022, 35 of those premises had mixed species at their house, meaning they had ducks and chickens or they had geese and chickens. And so those... Um, those species have different um, vulnerabilities to the influenza virus. And so the ducks might be the ones that can carry it and you might not see that they have any illness. They have no clinical science, but they're being a carrier of it. And they could get your chickens sick and then your chickens would die. And then you would be like, what's going on? And then the whole process would start that Dr. Voss is gonna talk about. And here it's because your ducks could be a very viable host for the virus without you knowing it. And then they introduced the virus to your chickens. So it's something to keep in mind. And I'm not here to tell you to not have multiple species. I'm just here to help educate because there are ways that you can keep both populations healthy and safe from each other without losing either one of them. So all in all, we would consider any of these introductions a breach in biosecurity. And I'll talk about biosecurity at the end of the evening um, to tell you more about what you can do to help, help prevent and reduce any risk of introduction. So for me, right off the bat to conclude, all you need to know is that influenza is complicated and you don't need to know everything to end an outbreak, but you do know that it needs to be, um, that it is a virus cause, sorry, you do know, you need to know it's a disease caused by a virus. It needs a host to survive. So any of our waterfowl, any of our domestic chickens, domestic turkeys, domestic geese, pheasants, it needs one of those types of hosts to survive and to continue to move on. Um, influenza viruses change and they will always get worse because they need to get stronger in order for the virus to survive. And you need to know when and how your birds are going to be at risk. And we're going to continue to offer you this type of information this evening. And you need to be able to know what decisions can be made to minimize your risk and know that influenza can be prevented with your biosecurity. 
So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to have Dr. Voss um, open her presentation and be ready. And um, I see there are some questions coming into the question and answer box. So please feel free to type any of those questions as the um, per presentations move about, so. Thank you, I know you're probably looking at the wrong screen and I'm having a hard time. How's that, is that better? That's perfect. All right, thank you for having me, Abby. I'm really glad to be able to have this opportunity tonight to talk to you about avian influenza and high path and what we're seeing in Minnesota and to try to get you guys some information so that you're prepared um, to help prevent it uh, alongside us um, uh, in the state. So I'm gonna kick it off tonight by just talking about what the signs of avian influenza are. And as Abby already alluded to, there are different types of avian influenza. Uh, the clinical signs that are listed here on this side a slide are, are typical of our highly pathogenic forms of avian influenza. And it's things like extreme depression within your flock, or you walk into your flock in the morning and they seem very, very quiet, which is pretty unusual. Um, some birds might exhibit a, a difficulty breathing. And so they're ex experiencing some respiratory science that's making breathing challenging. Um, you might first notice that there's a decrease in feed or water intake. And so they're just not drinking as much water as you would normally expect. Um, one of the kind of telltale signs of, of high path avian influenza is the swelling or a purple discoloration of the head, the eyelids, the comb, the waddle, or even their legs or their, their hawks in particular. That can be a sign of avian influenza um, for, for chickens or birds that are, are in production. You might see a decrease in the amount of eggs that they're producing. Um, and then one of the big things specifically for high path is a sudden unexplained death. So there's not something else that's going on within your flock that you, you know, you might be able to kind of explain that death. It's, it's a very sudden onset um, and you might have a lot of it. Um, low pathogenic forms, as Abby mentioned, uh, they're very mild. And so some flocks might not display um, many signs or the signs that you uh, see are, are pretty mild. And we even have you know, really experienced commercial flock owners who say, I didn't, I didn't see any evidence of uh, low path in my flock or even influenza in my flock. It's one of the best flocks that I had, but we've picked it up on some serology testing uh, that might indicate that they've had some past exposure to it. And so that's not necessarily what we're um, focusing the presentation on tonight, but I think it is important to remember that there are different forms of, of avian influenza. So where low pathogenic strains are not necessarily lethal, the high pathogenic or HPAI is almost always lethal um, in poultry. And I also just wanna mention that the signs on here are pretty general. And so there are a lot of other diseases in poultry that might present in a very similar way. And that's why it's very important to work with a veterinarian work with the state, work with the lab to make sure that we get a diagnosis and we know what's happening in your flock. So these are the statistics of HPAI in Minnesota since the start of our outbreak back um, in, in March of 2022. We've had a total of 111 total cases in 38 different counties across the state. Um, a lot of those are in commercial turkey operations, but again, as Abby mentioned, we raise a lot of turkeys in Minnesota. Turkeys are a highly susceptible species to this virus, and so it's not unexpected that we see higher numbers in those types of birds. We have um, had a commercial table egg layer operation and one commercial broiler operation, um, and then we've had our, our um, you know non-commercial premises. Um, as well, which is kind of the focus of, of tonight's presentation. This um, graph just demonstrates where we've had cases over the start of our outbreak since March 2022. Um, the green lines um, on this graph here each represent one particular case that started, you know, back, back on March 25th. Um, you can see last spring, uh, spring of 2022, we had a lot of cases in a very short period of time. So over the course of April and May, Minnesota got hit really hard. And then we did have a lull in our cases over the summer. And then right at the end of August, we started to see cases come back. And that's not unexpected as these cases 
um, tend to pop up kind of alongside or with the migratory patterns of our wild birds. And so as those birds started heading south um, and started to move again in the fall, we did have our cases. And then um, again, not unexpected, we had a lull in cases over the winter. And then unfortunately, uh, about two weeks ago, we did have one case in our backyard premises um, here. So back, you know, 300 and day 372 of the start of the outbreak. Um, this red line on this graph demonstrates the total cumulative cases that we had in 2022. And for comparison, this yellow line, if you can see it on this graph here, that was the cases that we had in uh, 2015. So we had a total of 110 cases in 2015 as well, but those cases all happened in the spring. And by the middle of June, um, that outbreak was done and that virus appeared to be gone as well. Again, just to kind of break down uh, the types of uh, uh, species that were impacted by HPAI in Minnesota. Again, we've got a lot of turkey operations uh, that were impacted and again, not unexpected, uh, just knowing the, the population in Minnesota. And the yellow bar here and this blue bar are our are, are backyard poultry operations. So um, uh, the World Organization for Animal Health breaks down kind of commercial and non-commercial and these are our non-commercial cases. And then we did have our two uh, commercial chicken operations. And uh, again, as, as Abby mentioned, we are not in this alone. Um, this is data that I pulled off um, the USDA website about an hour ago. So it's uh, slightly more updated than what Abby pulled off even this morning, um, but this is kind of our national picture. So 831 confirmed flocks across the US. Um, and then looking at this backyard number, uh, they're reporting 506 um, cases as compared to 325 within our commercial flocks. Um, and this map over on the right-hand side here, this, this is, um, continuously being updated by the US, um, USDA, and you can uh, select different variables to look at. And so I like to pull out here the total number of flocks just within the last 30 days to kind of get a, an idea of where the virus is potentially circulating. And so you can kind of watch this over time. And we're starting to see now some, some pop-up detections uh, showing up kind of in the central United States. And I know North and South Dakota just had cases within the last week. Um, as well. Um, so uh, again, not surprising with our spring migration underway, um, but uh, an interesting way to kind of visualize the data. So we frequently get the question about, you know, why should I test my birds? If, if we think avian influenza is all over the place, you know, why do I test if I think that maybe I've got them? Um, and there's three big points that I'm gonna walk through here. Um, the first point being that um, HPA is highly contagious and it is fatal for poultry. And so as Abby mentioned, that virus needs a host to survive. It needs a host to be able to spread. And we know that once introduced into a flock, HPA will spread throughout that entire flock and it can kill that entire flock. And so what testing does is that allows for that early detection with uh, the virus within that flock and that can help limit the spread of this very painful, um, severe illness in other birds. So if we can try to cap that um, and take care of the virus um, and the infection before it spreads to other birds, we're, we're one step ahead of the game. The other thing to consider is that the disease status for any type of poultry in Minnesota actually affects you know, all aspects of poultry in Minnesota. So whether you're a small flock owner with two birds, whether you're a commercial um, flock with two million birds all on site, you know, regardless of that flock size, detecting and managing high path is critical for preventing disease spread for everybody. And so we're, we have to remember that we are all in this together and protecting our small flocks and protecting our large commercial flocks is important to just protecting uh, poultry in the state of Minnesota. And lastly, you know, as a veterinarian, one of our biggest uh, concerns is making sure that animals, um, you know, are not suffering and we're looking out for the welfare of, of all animals. And so we want to make sure that we're placing a priority on that poultry welfare. Um, so we do conduct kind of a humane euthanasia of any HPAI positive flocks, which is, it's a very sad thing to think about, but it is necessary to prevent the spread um, 
to other flocks to prevent spread within that flock too. Um, and so if we know those birds are going to die anyway, it's better if we can try to make sure that they have a, a humane death instead of letting them suffer. And so when we do have detections within flocks, the euthanasia is performed by trained personnel and we always make sure that we're following approved uh, methods that are set forth within the American Veterinary Medical Association or ABMA. There's a lot of different uh, options for reporting. We always encourage even small flock owners to find a veterinarian that they can work with. Because as I mentioned on that first slide, there are uh, clinical signs that are consistent with avian influenza that are also consistent with a lot of other types of diseases. And so having a veterinarian that you can work with to try to sort that out and get a diagnosis is very valuable. I do recognize that a lot of veterinarians um, don't want to see or are not able to see poultry. And so it sometimes is a struggle, depending on where you live, to find that resource. Um, so just know that there is an uh, avian influenza hotline that you can call, and that number is on your screen. It's 1-833-454-0156, and you're welcome to call that number at any time to report to any illness in your flock. And we also have a nice online reporting form where you can type in your information and that gets emailed uh, to our response team in order to contact you. And then we ask some more questions about your flock and determine if we need to go out and do some testing. The other question that we get is what happens in a, in a high path response? Uh, what happens to that affected farm? What happens to farms that aren't infected? but they might be affected because of proximity. And so if we break it down, just kind of big picture here, you know, that affected site, so that farm that's infected with the virus, they do get quarantined right away to make sure that we're not moving anything on or off the farm to prevent any disease spread. We work with the flock owner on a depopulation and disposal plan to again, make sure that we're minimizing that risk of tracking any virus off of that farm. And then we also work with the, the producer at that time to make sure that there's a certain virus elimination activities that are being conducted so that at some point it will be safe to bring new birds onto that farm without reinfecting them of any virus. Farms that are located within a 10 kilometer zone around that infected site, that's called a control area. Um, those commercial farms do get quarantined and there is a testing expectation just to make sure that there's no latent infections or infections that we haven't detected yet due to clinical signs. Um, and we're doing some active surveillance to try to identify that and prove to those um, who are kind of watching our response that, that we've got um, activities that are controlled and there's no infections that haven't gone undetected. And those farms within the area also will have movement restrictions. And so because they're quarantined, they're not allowed to move anything on or off that farm without permission from the state. And so we work with those producers to make sure that they've got their testing in place and so that we're minimizing any risk of moving anything that is potentially infected but yet undetected off of that farm. And then we'll go to the next zone, which is a 10 kilometer zone that's surrounding that control area. And that's called our surveillance zone. And while nothing gets quarantined, there's not necessarily active testing that's happening with it in that zone. We also know it's very valuable and important to make sure that we're doing some outreach and notification so that producers are aware that there's uh, infection potentially in their area and to be watching out for any clinical signs and how to report if there's any concerns. One other thing that we're kind of looking at too you know, it was mentioned back in 2015, we had a very big outbreak. Um, and what's happening now in 2022 and 2023 is kind of the persistence of this virus. So we know uh, within this past year that the wild birds are more involved with virus spread than they have been in previous outbreaks. We know that the prevalence of that virus is very significant and it's impacting and infecting a large variety of different types of wild bird species. And that's allowed for that virus to really spread pretty rapidly um, across the US. One of the other things that we've noticed is when it first came into the US um, over on the Eastern seaboard uh, through Canada and then down along the coast is by the time that that virus reached the Southern US, it allowed for an overlap 
um, of birds that travel in different flyways. And so that kind of favored spread of the virus um, across the U.S., which is something that we saw in kind of firsthand um, as it spread across the U.S. in 2022. The big concerns that we have now is what's going to happen to this virus as it continues to change. It's very likely, and I think they're starting to see evidence that this virus is now starting to mix with some of our North American strains, low pathogenic strains. Um, and we're seeing that this virus is starting to spread to new species, including mammals. Um, and so, you know, there's been lots of reports of foxes um, and other, you know, bears, skunks that, that have been infected and died from this virus. And so uh, the scientists are really watching this virus to better understand how it's changing, how its ability to spread to new species uh, will impact the persistence of this virus within the environment. And so what that does to the virulence and the infectivity of this virus, I think is still to be determined. Um, and as was mentioned, I don't want you guys to think that um, you're helpless against this virus, but there are some certain risk factors for small flocks that I think you should be aware of. And, and Abby has already mentioned all of these things, but it's, I think it's a good thing as a reminder. Again, the flocks with mixed poultry species, so the ducks and the geese and the chickens that are all living together, those tend to be at higher risk because those ducks are a little bit better about hiding evidence of the disease. They may eventually succumb to the virus and die from it, but it might take a little longer. And so a lot of owners don't recognize that the virus has been introduced into their flock until their chickens start dying. Um, and then certainly proximity to, to bodies of water. So lakes, ponds, wetlands, things like that. We find that farms that are located closer to those bodies of water are at higher risk and they tend to become um, infected probably more easily than farms that don't have that, that proximity. Um, certainly any contact with wild waterfowl is a very high risk. Um, birds that have kind of unlimited outdoor access where you might not recognize that they're having contact with wild birds um, is a risk factor. And then, you know, the big thing, and I'll cover this on my next slide, is just very limited biosecurity measures. So again, I don't want anybody to think that there's, there's nothing that they can do and that this virus is just there um, because there are measures that you can do to protect your flock. And they're pretty simple measures too. And I know Abby's gonna go into this um, in more detail, but the big thing is to try to avoid or limit that contact between the wild birds, waterfowl, and your poultry. So if you can have a separate enclosed area there uh, that limits kind of that free access to where wild birds might be hanging out, limiting the attractiveness of your farm to some of those, those birds, like cleaning up your feed spills, you know, reducing those puddles. And again, it's difficult right now. My yard's a swamp as well, but if there's ways that you can try to reduce those puddles and stand in water to avoid attracting those birds, that's a good thing. And then starting to think about how you travel and how you move um, your birds and, and your person to different types of events that might increase risk. So if you like to take your birds to sales and shows and swaps, it's not that you can't do those things, but making sure that you've got some measures in place um, so that you know when you come back, you're changing your clothes, you're changing uh, your footwear, you're washing your hands, you're keeping those birds isolated from the rest of your flock uh, to just try to limit any potential disease introduction and doing the same thing with any visitors that come onto your farm. So discuss with them where they've been, making sure that they're coming to your farm with, with clean clothes, washing their hands, maybe using hand sanitizer, just again, simple measures that you can try to do to prevent tracking that virus um, onto your farm. Thank you, Dr. Voss. Um, for those that are in attendance, please go ahead and answer, type in your questions in the Q&A box. We will get to them um, shortly. Um, next, Michael, you are on deck um, to give us a little more information on where to keep up with everything. Excellent. Can you see my screen and hear me? Yes and yes. Excellent. All right. Well, good evening. I'll be brief. Um, so you probably hopefully saw some of the great things that Dr. Voss mentioned in her slides and showed you some snippets of some of the things we have with mapping and with dashboards, and maybe that piqued your interest and now you're wondering 
where do I view that? Where do I view the live dashboard? Where do I get more information? Um, that's why I'm here to just sort of give you that quick overview of what tools we have available on our website. So if you just head on over to our homepage and click on that highly pathogenic avian influenza by the picture of the chickens there at the top left, that brings you to really the all in one place where you can find 99% of what you need for the response. There are other areas and avenues where you can get additional information, but this covers the vast majority of what you might need to know um, for the outbreak and for the response. So right off the top of the bat, um, we're very interested in hearing from you if you do have sick birds. So we put the hotline information right at the top. And as Dr. Voss mentioned, there's that number that you can call. And then for those of you who are looking for that form and didn't want to save the URL um, for the online sick bird reporting form, you can simply click on a link here or down here. We have it again. Um, you can click on either of those links and that takes you straight to that sick bird reporting form that you could then simply fill out, uh, check on backyard, enter your information through the form. And then once you go through everything, just hit submit. And it's as simple as that. This form is 24 seven. So if it's the weekend and you're not sure if you should call the hotline or if it's something where you just wanna get it on our radar and let us know you have something going on that is suspicious to you, definitely encourage you to fill out the form. It's something that we just got a submission this afternoon that came into the form that one of our veterinarians looked into right away. Turned out there wasn't high concern but at least the person reported it to us. So we were able to look into that and evaluate that. So we definitely encourage the use of the online sick bird reporting form, which is again, available on that high path webpage here, just opening up the drop downs. You can click on report sick poultry. Um, <clears throat> it's also available here on the sidebar. So you can stumble on it in many different places, but we're hoping that uh, we've sprinkled it throughout the website enough that you can catch it multiple places and still get to the same result. Um, then we just have a very brief background of the situation. And then here's the Minnesota specific dashboard that we have for more information on the outbreak in Minnesota and totals and what flocks have been affected, et cetera. You can either view it here uh, it, as an individual dashboard, or you can open it up into a larger dashboard in full screen mode. But something to keep in mind with this dashboard when you're looking at it is that it is interactive. So if you go in and you click on certain aspects of the dashboard, for example, I clicked on Dodge 2. Now that will show me that I've selected one site. Um, if you look, you have to have really good vision to see it. But if you look, you can see where that one um, flock was during the outbreak. And then you can simply click again, and it brings you back to all of the additional information about the different flocks. And then it also, again, it's sortable, filterable, everything you can imagine if you just want to click around to learn more information. This is really great for people. Um, as the communications director, I've gotten a lot of feedback from media that they like it because they can get quick information from it. They can compile data, et cetera, to tell the story better. So if you're a numbers type person or you just want to try and understand the outbreak more visually, this is our quick fix to address that for you. Uh, further down here, we have another map tool that's available. Uh, you may be wondering about this map. Now that we've talked about earlier this spring, we had that case in Lesseur County. Well, I'm looking down here in Lesseur County and I don't see the dot on the map. And why is that? Going back again to Dr. Voss's presentation, there's that difference between uh, World Organization for Animal Health, backyard poultry or non-commercial and then commercial poultry. Um, so right now we don't have any commercial flocks that are positive in the state. And those are the ones that would appear on this map that you'd be able to see. So that's why you're not seeing that specific site on the map right here. But that just, again, is another tool that unfortunately when you're in the heat of the outbreak, it paints a really good picture for how vast the situation is, or hopefully like the map looks like right now, not very vast at all. Um, another snippet that you saw in Dr. Voss's presentation, that dashboard from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Again, you could go to USDA's site to find that. The information is available there, but we also have it right here on our website. So again, to those people who want to click through, this is um, information that you can click through, sort through, and view additional information by clicking around in the dashboard to learn more. Um, you can go ahead and click on different things to learn more information. Uh, for example, I clicked on Minnesota and it says last reported detection was April 3rd. Um, and additionally, the overall flocks affected commercial versus backyard and total number of birds. So that in a very quick nutshell is kind of the, everything you might need to know quickly about um, 
highly pathic avian influenza and your flock. Um, if you do want to learn more, again, this page is built with this little navigation pane on the left. So if you want to go all the way down to something about testing and reporting, we have obviously additional resources down here that can take you through it. Again, there's that online reporting form for sick birds, so you can stumble across it in more than one place. I think we've hit five now for those that have five as the bingo number for this. Um, or you can jump back up to a different part in the web page. So just using this navigation to pretty much learn everything about the response in Minnesota for highly pathog pathogenic avian influenza. And then also, um, hopefully we got some of you with our Facebook posts or you've seen some of our Facebook posts that we have out there about HPAI. But again, another avenue, it's not always 100% dedicated to um, highly pathogenic avian influenza, but we do put out information there as well. And again, a lot of that will bring you right back to some of these more focused resources and tools that we have on the board website. So with that, I will conclude my little portion and just encourage you all to check out the website if you need to find anything. If you have any questions, uh, please drop those in the Q&A and I will certainly sort that out and try and help you to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, Joni. Oh, she is ready to roll. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me and can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Okay. I'm here to talk about the human health side of this virus. This is the view from across my road to our neighbors. And um, these birds are beautiful, but you know what they do. <laughs> um, so I'm, this story about what is the human health risk from this H5N1 virus has gotten more and more complicated. So I'm going to tell you a um, nuanced and complicated story, and I'll be ready to answer any questions that you have. So in, in general, when you look at avian influenza viruses, um, they're spread to people through direct contact with infected birds or their environment. They're not generally spread from person to person, and it's not a public health risk or a food safety risk. The only risk there is, is for people who have direct contact with infected birds. So, sometimes, so <laughs> this is exactly the audience that you all are. But uh, it's not a risk to your neighbors who don't have chickens. It's not a risk to your family who comes over to eat in your house. It's only a risk to people who have direct contact with infected birds. And when people do get sick with avian influenza viruses, in general, the symptoms are very mild. You know, conjunctivitis or an eye infection is the most common thing because the, the receptors um, for avian influenza viruses are found in human eyes. So the most common infection we see with avian influenza is conjunctivitis, but um, it can also you can also see mild respiratory infection, but all the way to severe disease. And H5N1 and, and H7N9 have caused the most human infections worldwide. But I want to remind you that even though a virus has the name H5N1, it can be very different from another virus that has the same name. H5N1, because there are other genes um, that make up the virus, and uh, it's it's complicated. It's not H5s are not all the same. So this particular um, high path H5N1 is highly virulent in domestic poultry. And I just show you this shocking picture so that you, you know you realize why we're all here today is because this is a very serious virus in birds and. Um, when, you know, I, I interviewed a lot of people with backyard flocks because we do the human health side, and it is shocking um, how fast domestic chickens and turkeys die of this virus. So this, uh, it, this particular H5 is a descendant of the bad <laughs> Asian lineage H5 that is known to infect people, but it's a reassortant. It's not the exact same virus, and it's much less um, serious for people. So even though it does this really a number on birds and is very, very virulent and um, high, you know, almost all of them die in, in birds, it's not as serious in people. And you've got to keep that in mind, you know, that every species is different. And the molecular, when, when scientists look at the genome of this virus, 
I don't know if you'd say that about a virus. When the, when the, the uh, look at this virus, um, what they don't see is antiviral resistance, meaning that if a person would get it, we could give them Tamiflu and they would get better. And in general, we don't see uh, a lot of adaptation to mammals, even though, like Shana just said, it's been identified in a lot of different mammals. So that kind of confuses me a little bit, actually. And I'm going to, next time I'm around a viral expert, I'm going to ask them about that. So the first mammals that were identified with H5N1, this particular H5N1, were foxes. And they get a severe pneumonia and a brain infection, encephalitis. Um, we've had more than six cases of H5N1 in foxes in Minnesota, so we know it's we know it's in our Minnesota foxes. But what kind of does what public health is not? What has got public health a little bit wary is that this virus has been detected in a wide variety of mammals. Most of the most of them have been red foxes. I guess there have been about forty two or forty three of those in skunks but just a wide variety of animals, and many of them um, get very sick or die. So anytime that many mammals are infected by a, a virus, we do worry about people a little more than, uh, for example, we did in 2015 when the um, H5N2 back in 2015, high path AI, we didn't find it in mammals. It was just in birds. So even though there have been hundreds and hundreds of people, even just in Minnesota, we've monitored over 600 people that have had contact with infected birds in 2022. We haven't found any human infections in Minnesota. And of all the hundreds and thousands of people that have had contact with infected birds around the world, we've only identified a few people uh, who have either um, tested positive for the virus or had symptoms and tested virus positive for the virus. So the risk is low, but clearly people in contact with infected birds need to take precautions. And that's why I'm here tonight. CDC just put out a very interesting technical report um, in March of this year, which I'd recommend that you read. But this is the overview of their opinion of this virus. And I have to admit, CDC is being very reasonable. So what they're saying is this particular H5N1 virus is circulating all around the world. And we've seen sporadic spillover to mammals. Um, we've seen other related H5N1 viruses circulating in some countries. But the thing that is heartening is that all the people who've gotten this infection had um, extensive contact with poultry. There's been no human to human transmission. And there's no reason to believe that more people won't get sick. We just would like them not to be in Minnesota, please. Um, so, so far, this virus is not able to um, easily infect people and it's not transmitting from one person to another. But their conclusion is that doesn't mean that we, you know, we still need to keep watching and keep vigilant about this virus because they do mutate. And so what we do here at the Department of Health is um, uh, when an infected flag is identified, we get on the phone as soon as we can, especially if it's a backyard fl flock owner, and we ask them questions about, you know, what kind of contact they have with the birds, what kind of personal protective equipment they normally use, um, just get an idea of the, like, the level of contact with birds that they tend to have. And we provide recommendations right away for the personal protective equipment that we'd like to see them using, which I will get into it in just a few minutes. And then we ask those people if it would be okay if we contacted them, I'm talking to them now, and then if we contact them again at five days and five days after that at 10 days to be watching for respiratory symptoms or eye infections. And of course, anytime something like that would happen, then we want them to call us. And if you get symptoms, most likely it's not going to be this. Um, in 2022, we tested 23 people or 22 or 23 people, and we did not find this virus. We found all kinds of other human respiratory viruses. So if, if you get a respiratory you know, infection after your birds have gotten sick, please don't panic, but please do call us. And we'll arrange testing with our fancy laboratory, and we'll run an entire respiratory panel so we'll tell you what you do have 
um, as well as what you don't have. If you do have influenza A, which is the whole group of influenzas, including the human ones, uh, before we spend the time to figure out what, it, what kind of influenza it is, because that will take a little bit of time, we're going to be getting you on Tamiflu, which is fine even if it's a human one. Yes, that is if you're interested. We don't make you do anything. So, okay. So this is about the personal protective equipment. If you have healthy birds at home and you don't have sick birds, so before HiPath AI is in fact identified in your birds, we want you to, to follow good flock biosecurity, all the different things you've been learning tonight and all the different things you will continue to learn. Um, we would like you to use coveralls or coop specific clothing. Like you don't walk back in the house of all your clothing and sit down with your grandkids. Rubber boots or coop specific shoes, work gloves, wash your hands. Please don't kiss your birds. Um, <laughs> I know it's tempting, but don't kiss your birds. And please get your flu shot. This, um, it's the wrong season right now, but in the fall, get your flu shot because this helps. Let's, let's say that you came down with a human influenza and at the same time your birds got avian influenza, we'd like you not to be a mixing vessel where this virus can really mix it up with a human um, seasonal virus and make a, a virus that's um, transmissible. But, okay, so after high path AI is identified in your birds, then we want you to go full on like this picture you see here. Um, we want you to wear coveralls and a hat or Tyvek suit with a hood. So we want you covered up and we want you to wear rubber boots and uh, latex or nitrile gloves. You can put them over cotton gloves. Goggles, because like I said, this virus likes to attach to human eyeball, you know, human tissue around the eye, the conjunctiva, the, the pink part around your eyes where you get pink eye if you're a kid. So we want you to wear goggles and we want you to use an N95 or a KN95 respirator or mask. We call them masks when we're, you know, they're called respirators technically, but uh, they're masks. Of course, now everybody knows about that since COVID, how to get those. And please avoid touching your eyes, your nose, or your mouth while you're working with your birds. The Board of Animal Health will take over and, and um, like has already been described, take you through the um, situation, which is really is devastating. Um, and we hope that you don't have to go through it, you know, uh, yourselves. A lot of other people have gone through it and it's extraordinarily de devastating. All right. Some of these um, posters have been shown to already. And this is the one we really like because it's like, here's what you look like before your birds are infected. And here's what you look like after your birds are infected. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Awesome. Thank you, Joni. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here quickly, and then I'm going to wrap things up with just a few moments of um, biosecurity summary. And then we're going to go into the Q&A. There's been questions coming in most of the evening. Um, and we have been answering them, but I wanted to be able to share them with everybody. I'm not sure that everybody can see the answers. Um, so I'm going to get through the, the main concepts of biosecurity here for you. So what is biosecurity? I, we've been saying the word all night long and that's not the slide I wanted. <laughs> Here we go. Biosecurity are going to be the steps you're taking to prevent or reduce the spread of disease. So there's so many things that have been mentioned already this evening and, and just even with Dr. Sheptel talking about changing your boots and washing your hands and not touching your face and um, the personal protective equipment. Those are all steps and things that you're doing to prevent or reduce any introductions. So those are all biosecurity things. But the one thing that I want to impress upon all of you is there's really 
no solid recipe for biosecurity. There's general concepts, but biosecurity is going to look different for you than it is for your neighbor, than it is for um, somebody who's in the same 4-H club. You have to do biosecurity in ways that works for you, works for your management, and works for the property that you have your birds on. So to begin, I want you to think of biosecurity in three different tiers. And all three of these tiers actually comprise the bigger picture of biosecurity. So we're gonna start on the bottom with conceptual biosecurity. And that's going to be the environment and what's around you. So um, we've introduced the fact that there's been mammals that have had um, HPAI in this most recent outbreak. So do you live near woods where you have fox or raccoons or skunks? That's the concept. What's the environment around you? Do you live near bodies of water? Do you live near a river? Do you live near a lake? Do you have a swamp, a swamp or a pond nearby that attracts wild waterfowl? Do you live in an area that has a lot of poultry? Are you in North Minneapolis and a lot of your neighbors have poultry? Or are you in a community that has a large commercial poultry industry? Those are all the environmental concepts that you need to work with. One isn't better than the other. It's just a matter of understanding what your environment is around you and working with it instead of against it. The second tier is going to be structural biosecurity. What structures do you have that can aid your biosecurity, your efforts to prevent or reduce any introductions. This could be a coop, this could be a barn, this could be fences, this could be um, ex additional exterior buildings, a garage, what have you. We don't want you to bring your birds into the house to protect them from avian influenza. There's other <laughs> circumstances and considerations there that you need to take um, into, that come into play. But what structures, doors, fences, gates, um, uh, uh, roofs, roof, roof cover, those types of things. What structural assets can you have and can you use to aid in your biosecurity? And the third tier of biosecurity is what I spend most of my time on, and that's operational biosecurity. And that's the actions of us, the people doing the operations. What can we do to prevent or reduce that spread of um, avian influenza or any disease in our animals um, for that matter. So you've seen this poster, I'm gonna slide right over it. It's awesome, we love it. If you are buying chicks at a farm store, you're probably seeing this posted. I know my local farm stores have had it um, posted. It's a great, um, reminder of things you can do at home. If you see it, share it. But here are some more simple steps. Remember that personal protective equipment that Joni was talking about? That's one of the really basic steps you can do for biosecurity. So we're clean barn or coop specific clothing and footwear. And this also includes hats and gloves and scarves that we're probably all still wearing because of our cool and damp temperatures. So making sure that you can have outerwear that is warm enough to keep you warm so that you can effectively do the chores for your animals well-being, but having those be coop specific or barn specific. So you're not going into town. You're not um, having the opportunity to accidentally co-mingle with somebody else who might have birds as well. This is one of those operational biosecurity things because you are in control of changing those clothes and making sure that they're clean. Some of the next simple steps for biosecurity is to quarantine and isolate. This sort of falls into structural as well as operational biosecurity because we need to have the place, the facility to be able to quarantine and isolate a new bird. Many people are buying new chicks and introducing them to some older flocks. 
you need to be able to separate those animals for at least 21 days so that you can understand their health status before they are um, introduced to each other. If you have any other sick animals that you notice any respiratory illness, you wanna be able to quarantine that animal away from the rest of the flock as quick as possible. Or for those of you that um, happen to show your birds or um, participate in other activities, you wanna be able, and you're taking those birds away from your home premises, you wanna be able to quarantine those birds when they return as well, because they've been exposed to the outside world away from their home premises. And so having those facilities set up, maybe it's um, one corner of the garage you're using for your quarantine because the rest of the birds live out in the barn whatever the um, type of situation you can create with the structures that you have. Wash your hands and then wash your hands again and, and maybe wash your hands one more time. <laughs> it's one of those operational biosecurity steps that you can take and it's just a really important step to wash your hands before you go work with your birds and after. Maintain and use a line of separation. And this might be a term that many of you are unfamiliar with. Um, and if you are, feel free to contact me. I'll have my information up at the end of the presentation. Um, because this is something that commercial poultry is becoming very, very familiar with. And a line of separation, what that is doing is separating the outside world that could be potentially contaminated with any type of illness. And it's separating it from the world where your birds live. And so we call that the LOS. And this um, image is actually a um, a home in Northeast Minneapolis. And this person does own some um, backyard urban poultry. And this is their line of separation. They actually have an entire fenced in area where their chickens can roam when they are home. And this gate is there to, to be a physical barrier. It's that line that is separating anything from the outside world from the inside space that her hens have access to. And you can make, kind of see in the corner, there's a um, inexpensive plastic container. Um, my family always called them puke pan, <laughs> but a uh, dish pan maybe. I, that's probably where you would find it at Target or Walmart. Um, but it's filled with a bleach water solution that people can put their boots in there and they can quickly but effectively scrub any organic matter off of their boots with the scrub brush that is here too. And then that bleach solution is also going to act as a disinfectant. Using this type of um, a process needs to be done in an educated manner. You can't just put the pan out there and expect your birds not to get sick. There is a process in which to do this. And this person does um, ask any guests that comes to the premises to participate. Um, and it, it's even written on this sign here on the gate. So that line of separation can be very effective. And like I said, I'm willing to help explain this in further detail for anybody who would like to learn more. Take home tips is biosecurity truly is an everyday prevention. It's going to become the things that you do every day that's going to help prevent any um, potential disease in, um, introduction. When there is higher risk moments, say you know there's high path in the state again, or your neighbors have sick birds, then you might wanna take your biosecurity steps a little farther. But we want to encourage you to make biosecurity part of your everyday um, part of taking care of your birds. It is an investment. And then by an investment, I mean it can be a financial investment, meaning you might need to buy some supplies. You might, um, you might choose to buy a pair of cloth coveralls at the farm store, tractor supply or flea farm, um, so that you have coop specific clothing that you can just put on over your other clothes and you can take off when you leave the coop. 
it's a it's an inexpensive investment, but it's still an investment. And it's also an investment of your effort, building that culture and, and building those steps into your care for your birds every day is a little investment of your time, but it will be well worth it when you have healthy birds. Understand and know what your management style and your needs are. That's what's going to help determine the best way for you to implement your biosecurity. Don't do biosecurity because you think it's by the book. Do biosecurity because you know it's something that you can successfully comply with every time that you go to see your birds or to take care of them. And be flexible and adaptable. Situations are going to change. Seasons change as I'm looking out my window. And that forces us to be flexible with our biosecurity and the amount of time it might take. So that is all I have. We're a little past eight o'clock. There are some questions in um, the Q&A box that I would like to, um, to go through and to review. Many of them have already been answered. Um, so I am gonna keep um, this resources slide up. So if anybody needs to take a picture of it, they need to do a screen save, they need to write it down. These are all of them very, very, very important resources that we want you to keep handy. All right, first question. Um, is there any research if free range birds are less susceptible to HPAI? And Joni, you answered this and provided a really great answer. Would you mind unmuting and answering the question? Well, I only answered it because it was sitting there for a while. It's really not my, um, it's not my lane. And, <laughs> um, but what I answered was um, that actually free range birds would be more susceptible because they have more interaction with wild birds, which is the source of avian influenza. Um, and then what did I say? <laughs> Uh, when you interview backyard flock owners, they say most of their chickens actually died within a few days because yeah. they were free range and the virus spread really quickly. Yes. Yep. All right. Another question that came through is, which I think Dr. Voss answered. Um, so Shauna, prepare to unmute. <laughs> How long does it take for HPAI to spread among flocks and what's the incubation period? So it's a little bit of a difficult question because the incubation period may vary depending on the type of species that we're talking about. So I mentioned that, you know, waterfowl in general might be a little bit more um, resistant to at least showing clinical signs. And so that incubation period might be a little bit longer from the time that you actually start to notice uh, signs of illness. But in general, it can be anywhere from a couple of weeks, or sorry, a couple of days up to a couple of weeks. And, but on average, what we're seeing with this current strain of virus appears to be about five to seven days. Awesome. And while you're still on, um, what are your thoughts on poultry exhibitions such as fairs and fall shows? Yeah, there's actually two related questions to that. So we'll kind of knock both of them off. The other one was related to specifically for county fairs. Um, in 2022, in the spring, at the start of the outbreak, we were just a little unsure with what types of birds were being impacted by this, where the virus was located. And so we did end up putting a ban on uh, poultry uh, shows and exhibitions um, to make sure that we those types of events weren't contributing to spread. And so that ban, and I don't have the dates specifically in my mind, but I wanna say they went from about April, beginning of April um, through the end of June. We did not cancel any of the events or ban any events in the fall. And at this time, we don't have any plans to place any, any bans um, but we will continue to monitor the situation, both in Minnesota and across the United States. And if there's evidence that there might be some spread within those events, then we may make a decision in the future to potentially put some, some restrictions on those events. All right. Fantastic. Thanks. 
Uh, ba -ba. Are eggs affected? Are they safe to consume or to incubate? And Dr. Voss actually wrote a very good answer. Do you want to answer it? <laughs> answer that one too. <laughs> I will. And I'm, I might ask Joni to chime in too. You know, avian influenza in general is not considered an egg transmitted disease, like some other diseases that we look at in the poultry industry, like alarm typhoid disease or the mycoplasmas. Those are considered egg transmitted, which means they can go from the hen into the eggs and into the chicks. Um, that being said, we always recommend that eggs um, are handled properly and cooked properly to prevent any um, potential transmission of diseases, not just avian influenza, but salmonella is a big one that we worry about. Um, if for some reason we had contamination of a uh, virus on a hatching egg that was going into an incubator, that long incubation period with the elevated heat should be enough to, to prevent or kill off any virus and that shouldn't uh, contribute to spread of an infection. Joni, do you have anything you want to add to that? Sure. I mean, um, avian influenza is just totally not a foodborne uh, illness. And um, it's not that tough a virus. So unless you're, we wouldn't recommend you eat raw eggs from a flock that is having an ongoing, you know, where a flock that is sick right now. But um <laughs> No, don't worry about it. Just cook your eggs and you're good to go. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm moving ahead here too quickly. Is there any type of business insurance that farmers can acquire in case there is a loss of flock or is there government assistance? That's a Shauna question because, I mean, I can answer it too, but you, you have a great answer. I, I might have you back me up on this one. So, um, cause I'm not sure about the business insurance if you're able to actually purchase insurance to, to protect against this. But what I do know is from the government side, from USDA and the state, if you had a flock that was infected um, and we have to put those birds down, you are, paid the, the value of those birds uh, that we have to put down. So that's called indemnity. Um, and that is provided um, as a way to, to make sure that producers are reporting in a timely manner. Um, and we're, we're making sure that we're getting that under control. Um, if there's specific virus elimination activities that have to happen on the farm, like cleaning and, cleaning and disinfection, you are compensated for, for those costs as well. Abby, I don't know if you have additional information that you can uh, support that question. I, I don't have additional questions. So like loss of productivity during that time, fallow period. Um, I, I don't know if there's business insurance. That's a really great question. I will have to look into that. I'm writing myself a note, so I do look into it. All right, there's some unanswered questions as well. Um, what level of bleach solution should be used for a foot bath? Um, that is going to vary. And I've seen multiple different dilution ratios. Um, that instance was one cup of bleach per one gallon of water. Um, those conditions change with temperature. Uh, what type of organic matter is in that tub um, because then the organic matter is going to dilute the effectiveness of even the bleach. But bleach is a very inexpensive disinfectant and you want to make sure that you're using it per label directions um, and there might be a lower dilution rate on the label for influenza viruses. Um, but that example in that particular instance was one cup per one gallon of bleach. Um, and then there's another question, Shauna, I think we can probably tag team this one too, or what are the steps for cleaning coops after a flock has been identified with the virus and euthanized? 
It, yeah, I can attempt to tackle that one. It kind of depends a little bit on the situation. So most of our, our backyard flock owners, um, we we enter into a what's called a fallow period, which is basically kind of a, a sit empty with no birds on site to allow that virus a chance to to kind of die off on its own. As, as we've, we've pointed out within this webinar that you need a, a live host in order to make it make sure that it survives. Um, and the reason why we do that for these small flock owners is it's sometimes really difficult to attempt to clean and disinfect um, the environment because, um, again, as we pointed out with the risk factors, a lot of these birds have outdoor access and you can't clean and disinfect mud and grass and, and all of those environments. That makes it really difficult. And so then the safest way is to just make sure that it sits empty. Um, and yes, Colleen, I just saw your, your point. Sunlight is your friend. Sunlight, heat, all those things can help um, as part of that disinfection process. And so then we just allow time. And one of the other things to mention too is if your flock is truly confirmed with high path, you're not just left to drown on your own, that you will have a case manager assigned to you and they will help walk you through all of these processes. So that if you have additional questions or circumstantial questions, those people are there to help answer those questions. So you're not just left to do it all by yourself. Um, so it, it, you'll have help if that was, if that's the case. Um, but I think with the question being, what are the steps? That's, that's a good, good answer. And sunlight is great. It would just be nice if the sun would show itself. <laughs> um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so with that, I will prepare to sign off. Please contact myself at University of Minnesota Extension or anybody at the Minnesota Board of Animal Health through their website um, and use that Minnesota Avian Influenza hotline or report sick birds online. We would be happy to answer your questions because hopefully we're answering your questions with respect to preventing any illness in, instead of actually responding to a presumptive case. So thank you for your time this evening. I thank all of the presenters and have a good night.